My guest today is my good friend, Dr. Justin Clausen, who teaches theology at Bellarmine University in Louisville. On this episode, we talk about a variety of topics, including Justin's work on Charles Taylor. All right, well, welcome, man. Thank you. A uh, question I always like to ask everybody is, what was your first car? Whoa. Oh, my first car was, uh, <laughs> this is actually kind of interesting one. I, uh, I had a 1976 Mercury Marquis with a 460 V8 uh, that was uh, lowered right to the ground, painted metal <laughs> fleck green, and Wait. had wire wheels on it. And, Wait, what uh, country are you from? From Canada. <laughs> yeah, you know what? So here's what happened. I was at um, my dad. My dad's uh, work. They have a car rally, or they had a car rally every year. And what does that mean? Well, just uh, every all the employees would bring their their cool cars, and and you know you'd have some kind of I don't know scavenger hunt. There's like a barbecue and stuff. Okay. And, and uh, and anyway, this this one car, this marquee was there, and I was only 15, and I saw this thing, and it was for sale. And my dad, I don't know if this is unfair or not, but my dad was the guy's boss, but I asked him, you know, <laughs> what are you selling it for? And he's like, oh, you could have it for 1,500 bucks. What? Yeah, and it was a beautiful car. I mean, yeah. very impractical and inefficient. Totally. And my dad took me out to, to go test drive it and he let me buy it and then I didn't get my license for a year so I parked at my uncle's house <laughs> under a cover and I would just go over there and look at it you know until I could finally drive it so when I think of Canada I'm sure my I've been there a few times my opinions are not uh, fully formed but I'm imagining everyone driving hybrid fuel efficient <laughs> sure cars yeah 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 that drive yeah. up onto buses yeah and, yeah and a bicycle <laughs> attached and a kayak no, as well no no i mean you know the place the place where i grew up uh near vancouver but not in vancouver it was actually kind of rural i mean oh, the, yeah. you know um they had guns. canada is so uh is just so huge space wise and so if you're not in one of the main concentration centers you're you know there's just a lot of lands so a lot of trucks and you know big boats like that, I guess. Yeah. But. Why don't you pick a number between 13 and 35? Uh, 26. 26. Okay. Just go straight, yeah. All right. Oh, wow. I'm going to have this fun. Oh, my goodness. Me. Oh, wow. All right, so page 25, is that what you said? 26. 26. All right, open page 26. <laughs> oh, this is, and, uh, this is tricky. Read a few I don't know if I signed off on this. Oh, right. man. Well, it's your essay. Um, yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, this is this is a really long, dense paragraph, right. actually. But <laughs> in order to illustrate what he takes to be a striking contrast between modern and biblical visions of the neighbor, the proper object of the Christian ethical obligation, Taylor refers us to Ivan Illich's reading of the parable of the Good Samaritan. According to Illich, those of us who have been shaped by the Western shift toward an institutionalized Christian ethic will tend to see the parable as rooting our obligation to the wounded man on the road in a universal category of neighbor, a category that the narrowness of the priests and the Levites' vision could not imagine. But for Illich, as Taylor notes, this reading indicates our readiness to miss what is crucial at this point. That is, we reveal our supposition that substituting a new and now universal category for our formerly narrow ones can solve the problem of a tendency to exclude some people as the objects of our ethical obligations. For Illich, however, a truly radical re-envisioning of the ethical life cannot concede any ground whatsoever to the human tendency to categorize. Thus, Taylor tells us that on Illich's reading, what is given in the parable is not a set of universal rules applying every, anywhere and everywhere, but another way of being. Anyway, I'm going to stop there. That's but, fine. Yeah, yeah. Can you uh, exposit that for us? Yeah. Um, I, I guess, you know, Taylor's project in a secular age, go left here, we can kind of go around the loop, and then we'll keep going. Taylor's project in a secular age um, sort of culminates at the end in, in this account of, I guess, contemporary uh, alienations. And um, one of the things that, that he thinks has taken place in particular is uh, the alienation of, I guess, ordinary and fleshed experience from uh, kind of those, the big uh, and now abstracted notions of morality and moral reasoning. And so he finds in Ivan Illich, who really emphasizes, and Taylor then emphasizes as well, that in the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus is uh, talking about the guts, like, like the, the, um, 
like when when the man feels pity for the wounded man uh, on the road that it's about it's something actually concrete and material in his body that he feels and so Taylor's trying to uh, use a kind of uh, you know reading of the gospel ethic to um, re-enliven some of those passions uh, that have been he thinks um, you know separated by this modern sort of false dualism between what is good and then just what is ordinary and what is felt and he thinks that those two things uh, the gospel really holds together so okay well don't tell me more about this book overall so uh, yeah, aspiring, aspiring, to, aspiring fullness to Fullness in a Secular Age, Essays yeah. on Religion and Theology and the Work of Charles Taylor. Um, you know, I got started on this project with my, with my co-editor, Carlos Colorado, who is a friend, um, and we went to grad school together. And a very cool name. Yeah. Carlos yeah, Colorado. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and he's a cool guy, too. He, uh, well, the two of us are reading Taylor, and um, there weren't a lot of people in... I guess our PhD program that were all that interested in Taylor, I think some found him to be not theological enough. They, they just found him to be too much the kind of modern and, uh, you know, basically enlightenment romantic philosopher or something. Well, the romantic part. Yeah, I yeah, the yes, part yeah but like that he was doing some Hegelian synthesis right. of this and he wasn't really interested in theology per se. And it's true. I mean, he's not a, a kind of the sort of typical theologian for the church. Um, and but we really felt that uh, Taylor brought a lot to theological conversations that right. were then you know being ignored by some of our uh, peers, and so we had this idea of of uh, getting theologians to write about Taylor. Yeah. And uh, we're PhD students. Yeah, we're PhD students. Point, again, yeah, right, and awesome. and our PhD supervisor Travis Craker was yeah. like, well, you should do that. You should write a proposal for a book. Yeah. And yeah, we did, and we sent it to Notre Dame Press, and we, we uh, invited people, to, and people signed up to write for it. That's and awesome. Yeah, so what year so, was this? Oh, boy, this would have been, I mean, it probably started in, like, 2009. Okay. And the book actually came out in 2014, because that's how this, this stuff yeah, works, totally. you know, so. Edited volumes. They yes, take a long time. they take yeah. a long time, but... But yeah, we were happy with it when it when it did come out. That's so, great. Well, so, Taylor was also very generous with Carlos and myself. I wonder if would, you have a He would... You know, he'd come and give a public lecture at a university nearby or whatever, and we'd go talk to him, and and we knew that he was writing a secular age. Okay. That's and we knew that that's, this was going to also, this was going to get the attention of, of uh, theologians in a way right, that some right. of his earlier work uh, might, maybe didn't. And um, before the book even was published, he sent us, you know, the whole manuscript in Word document form and was like, wow. let me know what you think, you know. So this <laughs> he book, was just great. This book was in process before Our Secular Age came out then? Well, I don't know that the book was in process, but our conversations with yeah, Taylor yeah. were in process, okay. yeah, yeah. So this, I mean, so it really hit in a time, I can't remember what year the Secular Age came out, but... Yeah, but it hit. 2007. Okay, so yeah, it, okay, yeah, it, it was Yeah, it, was it came before out before, that. yeah, yeah. What would you say, you know, speaking even more generally, what would you say Taylor's contribution to the church and theology could be? I mean, he's not a theologian. Yeah. I don't know what his personal faith commitment would be, yeah, would yeah, be yeah. expressed yeah. to be or anything, but... I think he's, I mean, I think he's a kind of broadly, you know, uh, what some people refer to as a Vatican II Catholic. Okay. Um, but, yeah, that's not necessarily, that's not, uh, he doesn't put that front and center right. in, his, in his work. Um, but his contribution... To the church, um, I think to some extent has to do with uh, explaining the the characteristics of uh, a secular age um, that I think I find actually therapeutic because uh, there's there's the way that we believe today is Taylor calls it um, fragile, uh, and he talks about the fragilization of belief and, and just that. We live in a, a pluralistic society and in a world where uh, theism is not now taken as a given. And so, you know, even the most uh, devoutly religious people are religious in a way that's almost like you're looking over your shoulder. He, he has this line in A Secular Age. And, it's a speck um, everywhere. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah you, can, you can go out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I feel like that's something that is poorly understood in the contemporary church because... 
I think there is, I mean, we've all seen the statistical evidence about the decline of traditional religious affiliation, the NONEs, and you know, you kind of have like evangelical churches that are maintaining uh, um, sort of in their church attendance, but you know, most other denominations are, are actually declining. And right. in my experience, um, you know, undergraduate students are coming into college with less and less uh, just literacy about religion. Um, that doesn't mean that they have um, no, you know, deep ultimate questions or, or spiritual lives by any means, but it does mean that um, they are, I guess, uncertain in a way that the church has not really known how to grapple with. And so, yeah, they don't show up, you know. Um, so I think that Taylor gives us a way of thinking existentially about the situation of modern belief uh, that prohibits us from just being dismissive of the nuns and of, you know, people that are uh, thinking about religion in new ways and uh, nuns, demanding... N-O-N-E. N-O-N-E, yes, yes, exactly, yeah. So, and I think that's of tremendous value um, because I think, you know, preachers need to be aware of this. And I think preachers are aware of it, even in their own relationship to their faith. And, uh, and then you got to figure out, okay, what does that mean then to affirm with confidence, uh, you know, the Christian confession um, in, in an age like we live in today? And, uh, and I think Taylor can be really, really helpful on those points, so. Top few influences on your own theological development would, so Taylor would probably be in that at least in certain th- theological ways. Yes, would, would yeah. Martin, would Martin be another one of those? You know, or? I mean, um, he won't, be, he won't be in trouble if oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Merton's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Wait a minute, you're no. a Bellarmine and Merton's not? Merton yeah. is now uh, because I, I actually think that he's a person that gets this situation of modern faith and got it already. A lot of things that have occurred to me since coming to Bellarmine. Now, I read Merton as an undergraduate student, um, but, you know, I, I didn't become the sort of... Uh, fanboy that that sometimes people you know just really get upset he's like Kierkegaard in that sense I kind of went more the Kierkegaard direction actually if we're talking about you know who I'm a fanboy of but um, anyway but then when I came to Bellarmine where there's such a connection to uh, the life and work of Thomas Merton um, and started teaching him uh, I just recognized all this stuff that he was saying in the 60s about what it's like to be a person of faith in a modern culture that seems so uh, prescient, you know, that, that how did you know that? I mean, you didn't even know about smartphones and technological right. distraction in the way that we really know about it now. And um, So I guess maybe it's as far as the relevance of the contemplative life, uh, that has spoken to me deeply um, in recent years, just in terms of my own habits and sure. let alone than what that offers um, to the theological imagination in a more scholarly ways. If you were to put Taylor and Merton together in a Venn diagram, what are some ways that they overlap for you personally or yeah. even just generally and what they can offer? Um, you know, it's interesting. Taylor actually came to Bellarmine and gave a lecture on Merton. Really? Uh, yeah, a really few like years that. ago. Um, so in 2015, it was the 100th anniversary of Thomas Merton's birth. And so there were a bunch of events at Bellarmine. And, and Taylor came, and um, I think I would have liked it to be even more about Merton, uh, his his lecture. But um, what it did indicate to me is that they share a lot of insights about the way that language functions and the the need for us to pay attention, um, oh, really? that, yeah, to the formative important? impact okay. of language. And because I mean, Merton was very um, he was very keen on uh, he's in this book grades on the unspeakable. Uh, he's got this essay called Rain and the Rhinoceros. And uh, anyway, he, he's meditating on what it's like to listen to the rain out at the hermitage. Uh, and he's suggesting, he draws a contrast between the meaningless speech of God's good creation, meaningless only in the sense that we have not already learned how to manage or control it, and the speech that most of us operate by, which he calls the speech of city life, where everything is ordered and controlled. and um, and we don't often think about the formative impact of that. When we assume that the myth of city life is the real world, we lose out on the breath of life in creation. And um, I feel like Taylor is very attuned to the, the function of language in a similar way. So I think that they overlap in that sense too. I, I wouldn't have guessed that was the connection. I, 
I know we've talked in other contexts. I just finished reading The Language Animal, which uh-huh. he was probably writing at that time in 2015. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. The lectures in fact, it probably, constitu- yes. Constitu- yes. nature of language yes. and all that. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, it was very helpful. The HLC versus HHH sort of models of language and how they uh-huh. form us. Right. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, did, I wouldn't have guessed that that was part of how Merton Oh, was yeah, that. absolutely. Okay. That's why, I mean, Merton was also a poet. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, some of my my poet friends are maybe not super keen on some of his poetry or, or whatever, um, but I, uh, I mean, that was a very important piece of like how he thought about s- expressing uh, creaturely experience and, and in relation to God. Right. Um, you couldn't do it only by theology per se, you know, so. You wanna say something about Kierkegaard and his influence on you? Um, Sure, his influence on me is is pretty profound. I have uh, I have understood, I think, really what God's agenda for uh, healing the sinful creature is, really through Merton's kind of uh, existentialism. And, yeah, Kierkegaard, yeah, sorry, right? sorry, Kierkegaard's existentialism. And uh, when I first read Kierkegaard, it was. Um, I think it was more just like fun with words, like like it just you know, self is a relation that relates itself to itself, and it relating itself right, right. to itself relates itself, and and it's like if you can figure that out, you like win a prize kind of thing, and um, so it made me feel smart to sort of get it, um, but then the the more in my life uh, that I encountered, I guess just the way life. Um, gives you things that are beyond your power to manage and control. So um, I, like many academics, have experienced uh, life's excess of my plans. And uh, I remember this one time I was I was angry that I wasn't landing a tenure track thing and I had done what everyone said to do, you know, finish the dissertation, uh, publish the, the dissertation, and uh, get good teaching of value and you know I was doing all this stuff and and still jobs are are hard to come by and um, so I was kind of doing this like woe is me thing even though I felt totally just like we do sometimes right and um, and my wife she kind of looked at me and she's like don't you like don't you kind of like love that guy who talked all about kind of how to deal with anxiety and like what it really means to be a creature and 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 I was like, oh yeah, like maybe it's not just that it's smart, but it like helps you, right? It works. So, Job's um, wife. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So, and then I went away from Kierkegaard for a long time, and after I, I published the dissertation, that. no, 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 I said that to you. Yeah, no yeah, more. Yeah, no, yeah, I'm exactly. over him. I don't want to learn any more good things that are hard. If I'm yeah. gonna have to apply this stuff, yeah. he's out. Yeah, yeah. Right. no. Um, but I've been interested in, in theology and environmental ethics, and, and uh, Kierkegaard is is sometimes, you know, held up as a kind of villain of of the sort of theology that really doesn't pay a lot of attention to the non-human world. Because it's so interior. Yes, it's, 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 it's all inner, it's all, you know, and talking about the human being being uh, uh, defined or, or qualified as spirit and that being so much different from any and so he just he's not interested um, you agree with that assessment uh, oh I agree with the assessment that he's not interested right. in in, uh, in the non-human world though I mean there are times when he can rhapsodize about creation in a way that rivals Augustine I think so um, so then again I don't know but it's not formalized in his thought and uh, and yet more recently I, I found a way to sort of come back to him and I wrote something on on um, Kierkegaard and uh, and basically how he suggests we we should relate to the future in hope and uh, I wrote an essay about that and its connection to uh, some environmental uh, ethicists in, in the Christian world and, and what they're proposing so yeah um, I think he, I think he's gonna stick with me yeah okay, good. <laughs> so uh, what are you working on now what am I working on now? I'm I'm, uh, I'm working on a book project about uh, theology and music, and uh, specifically the music of Jason Isbell, who's a sort of a alt country or Americana rock and roll uh, uh, artist who used to be in Drive By Truckers, and so I'm I'm really thinking a lot and writing a lot about um, 
you know, I sort of had to grapple with this question when I started the book because I knew I wanted to, um, to do it. I, I love his lyricism and, and his music. And, and I got this opportunity, you know, there's a book series on kind of theology and music. And, um, but as I started, I realized I had to address the question very directly before I kind of got into what I wanted to say. Uh, why would you write a book on theology and music? And, and so I've, I've actually had fun uh, wrestling with that question a lot, you know. And, um, and the answer is? Um, well, I mean, I guess the answer is uh, it's related, again, to the kind of Taylor Merton stuff we were talking about before, that um, the way that the human uh, as a creature relates to God is, um, or really relates to God's reality, is uh, limited in certain ways. And that makes us fearful. And fear is a, a, a bad you know, spiral to go down. And one of the things that can help ward off our fear about uncertainty in life is not only denying it, that's what we're very good at, so we just deny it. And, and one of the ways we deny it is we try to manage and control the truth in a very rigid way. And music uh, is a different option for that, and poetry is as well, where it's like a way that we can express and, and, and um, articulate our experience, but it's less controlled, and it's not about the tidiness. And it's, it's more, I guess you could say, in the form of praise. Um, which is, you know, which requires a kind of relinquishment of control and as lament. well. And lament, right. yeah, absolutely. And lament, yeah. And so what do you think? Why Isabel? His lyricism, maybe he's tapping into deep sort of existential questions? Yes, was, exactly. He's tapping right. into deep existential questions. He's, uh, um, he just has a very uh, high literary sensibility. And so he doesn't, he writes lyrics in a way that that um, challenges uh, common conceptions of, you know, even just typical things that, that songs are supposed to be about on the radio, and uh, and yet he makes you he makes you kind of uh, he moves you in a way. I mean, there's one song in particular that's a love song, and uh, he talks about uh, vampire yeah vampire. yeah if we were vampires, and the whole thing is that it's not about the promise of like the forever. It's really about acknowledging that this is limited, and um, and and just the richness of the gift of love in that context, and so it's like this song that makes you reckon with a sad fact, a fact that all of us uh, confront as sad, and yet you feel you are moved, I think, to love by that very thing. What's a book you've read in the last year that? Of any sort, any genre. Of any genre. Just comes oh, to mind man. That is like kind of blown your mind or thought it was particularly beautiful or you can't stop thinking about. Yeah. Anything like that. And I happen to know one that we both just read recently. Yes. That's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah, in that yeah, category, yeah. maybe it doesn't reach that, that level. So, no, I mean, George Saunders is up oh, there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so he's. The nice Isabel connection there, too. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. So they've, they've had some interactions. Um, I. Uh, I mean, Lincoln and the Bardo knocked me out. Um, I read that because of you. Okay, yeah, and actually, you know, in that that book, Saunders is kind of reckoning with, with mortality and and you know uh, a lot. So anyway, um, that book, and then I also love Tenth of December, which is a collection of stories that uh, uh, each one is its own just incredible world of uh, of sort of moral questioning, but also. Uh, it, it, exi it has its own integrity, even if you don't. I mean, it's, he's, he can be like both didactic, he's teaching you something, but also not, you know? Uh, so, so I really enjoyed that. And then uh, recent books that I've read uh, in theology, I really have enjoyed Christian Wyman's book called My Bright Abyss. And I think the subtitle is something like Meditations of a Modern Believer. Okay. And uh, it's a, it's a uh, you know, Christian Wyman is a poet. He teaches at Yale. And, uh, but he wrote this book of theology that uh, it's really a very personal book, um, wrestling with a cancer diagnosis and the doubt that this raised about his own Christian faith. And he kind of, I mean, this is, he's to me in some ways like an example of the, the experience that Taylor in a secular age is charting philosophically. Mm -hmm. And Wyman is like, is laying it out there for right, you, right, what that right. looks like for an individual. And 
Uh, it's a it's a powerful book. So when you take a road trip, yeah, I love to, road trips to the vehicle. Uh -huh. So you love road trips. What's that look like for you? What do you do on a road trip? Um, so we actually took a we we spent a month on the road last summer. Wow. Uh, you know our our whole family and um, we went. Uh, we went kind of, we went all the way to Vancouver from, from here in Louisville. And, wow. uh, and on the way back, <laughs> we, yeah, and we camped in the Rockies uh, wow. and um, we spent time on a lake in uh, Manitoba. And, uh, and then we spent time in Vancouver. And then on the way back, we spent a few days in Yellowstone. And, um, you know, so part of the trip was to see family and stuff, but. Um, wow, what that's we, awesome. Yeah, yeah. And what we kind of started doing this time is we used to do it like, you just get up and you go as long as you can, you know, and as and just right until everyone is upset right, right. with each other, right? <laughs> and uh, this time we didn't plan any days longer than about eight hours of driving, and most were a little bit shorter than that. And so we stopped, and we would like have. So what it looks like for us is we have a, we always have a big cooler, and uh, instead of stopping at restaurants for the most part, we stop at grocery stores, and then we we make a meal. Um, by the side of the road or in a park yeah. somewhere. And yeah, so, yeah, we discovered Which some really beautiful places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. And so, do you all listen to music together? So, my wife and I will often listen to um, books on tape, okay. or else she, one of us will read whoever's not driving. Okay. If you reach down into that pocket, you'll see there's a bunch of envelopes. You can yeah, choose yeah. any color you want. Oh. I don't know what that other thing is. That's nothing. Oh, okay. That's another, okay, so this is like a library <laughs> card or yeah. something. It's yeah. A, it's a very old library card. I don't know what that is. And there's some random, you can put that here. There's some random question in there. Oh, okay. I don't know what it is. Yeah. And uh, you'll give an answer to it and I'll commit to answering it. Okay, okay. I don't okay. know what it is either. Oh, this is, this is good. We'll see. Uh, unpredictability. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What's a life motto you try to live by? Eat, drink, and be merry. Hey, you drink and be merry. <laughs> That's in the Bible? It is, yeah, yeah. So I don't have, I guess I don't have like a, you know, automatic uh, phrase. But well, describe it and we'll make one up. Yeah, we'll that make will one be your out. new life motto right here. We'll make um, one. I guess it would be something like uh, Sabbath anytime um, hmm. because we are busy hmm. and we have. Uh, you know, the kids are in different things and we're driving and, and uh, taking them to stuff and we both work. And, um, and sometimes that can get overwhelming when you look at your week schedule and you go, where is the time just to be and to uh, be grateful? And um, something that uh, Melissa and I have kind of done in the last year is just recognize that, okay, those times when we do have that actual block that day that really allows us to be restful and grateful um, we can those same practices are available to us even in windows of time that are you know not officially on the schedule as rest right and so we're trying more consciously to to do that and to, to sort of encourage the kids to do that too you, you can just go out for a walk when you have time yeah, you know and, that's, and that's so, a great one Sabbath like anytime yeah 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 you've never there, described there you it go. that I've way never, now never, you, yeah, now you've never used the motto. motto yeah to whom much is given much is required uh -huh. I think for me for a lot of years that's been not me not applying that to other people only to myself yeah 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 in the sense yeah. of um a deep consciousness that anything that I have is a gift and it's fragile. Yeah. Um, and that the only thing I can do with a gift is be faithful. Yeah. Yeah. So whether it's just anything. Yeah. And so for me, that's been, I th I think generally healthy. Of course, that yeah, can yeah, yeah. be that can be unhealthy like anything, right? I mean, it could be become this obsessive sure. thing. I don't I don't think I wear it. Um, just the next street. Yeah. I don't think I wear it negatively. I think it helps me to remain humble and right. sober. Right, right, yeah. So I think that was... No, I love that. Me. I love that. I like Sabbath anytime or any, anywhere as well, though. Maybe I'll adopt that. <laughs> no, but good. I think, I mean, the way that you described what uh, your motto, um, I think there's a, there is a connection there, uh, you know, thinking about life as a gift. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and yeah, because part of, like, busyness is also assuming that I don't know you're the you're the master in some way right and uh, and we're called you know our society sometimes calls us to relate to life like that and uh, instead to think of it as as uh, you know entirely gratuitous right cool man well thanks a lot thank you for your time yeah really this is great it.
And thanks for the coffee. Yeah, you're very welcome. You hey, bet. thanks so much for watching. Three really quick things. If you like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel and connect with us on social media. We'd really appreciate it. Secondly, check out the comment section below. We've put a bunch of program notes and links to interesting things there. And third, check out some of our episodes. You can see linked here. Thanks. We'll see you on the road. Peace.